Hi guys, Affinity Breakdown with another Reddit story time. Before we begin, trigger warning, there are mentions of unaliving and other dark topics in this video. On a lighter note, a quick reminder before we start, Thankmas is soon. You can already donate, but donating is not an obligation. Just sharing the link is enough. Also, one of the writers has written a book and I'll be sharing that link down below as well. I'll be sharing more information at the end for Thank Miss. Now, if you're ready, let's get into it. I had a nightmare between states of awareness. This took place around mid-October 2021. I'd been spending time with an individual I considered a love interest. I'll call them Sig, since I smoked a lot. Sig made it clear that they also viewed me as a love interest, so things were pretty chill. We never had an official relationship because I decided to stop seeing them, partly due to their role in this story. It was pretty late one night and I was completely ready to just face plant onto my pillow. I couldn't be bothered to brush my teeth. I fell asleep instantly and then I woke up, except my alarm didn't go off. It was still pitch black outside my window. It wasn't that big of a deal. I woke up in the middle of the night somewhat often, but someone was standing next to me, right up against the bed. For a time, I pretended to still be asleep, as if that would change anything. The person then took my hand and placed it on their stomach. Yeah, it sounds <coughs> fucking weird. I have no idea why they did this. Never got an answer. I wasn't really questioning that at the time. I was more focused on getting killed. Anyways. By touch, I was almost 100% certain this was Sig. For a split second in my mind, I relaxed until I remembered that they lived 40 minutes away from my house and couldn't drive. And you know, how the fuck did they get into my house without a key? My phone was so close to me, but I was too scared to move. My heart was beating out of my chest until that night. I don't think I'd ever feared for my safety to that extent. They just stood there, unwavering. I didn't know what the <coughs> fuck they wanted. If anything, I thought of a scheme that I thought would take them off guard. To be blatantly honest, at this point my mind desperately wanted to believe it was Sig, so my strategy revolved around that line of thinking. I'd never told Sig I love them, because I didn't, and we hadn't even been seeing each other long enough to merit that kind of feeling. So I thought I could throw them off guard. I told them that I loved them. They were my world, all that cheesy bullshit. <coughs> the next thing I knew, my hand was just hovering, not touching anything. Oddly enough, it felt like my heartbeat quickened for a couple of seconds after realizing they were gone, and that maybe it was a nightmare? honestly can't decipher if I was dreaming or not, or if my brain was mixing nightmare with reality. The closest thing I can compare this to would be sleep paralysis. Though I could move, I believe I was seeing and feeling something that wasn't actually there. So far, it's the weirdest and scariest experience I've ever had. I never checked the clock. For me, personally, that's a big deal. My parents didn't take it too seriously, and I guess that's why it was easy for me to brush it off. Though, sometimes I can take myself back to that horrible feeling. I felt helpless. I was terrified. I lock my door every time I'm in the bedroom, day or night. But looking back, one good thing that came out of this was realizing I'm not really ready to die. I've had issues in the past with depression, and this is kind of clear everything up, you know? Whether my brain tells me I want to die, now I know I truly am not ready for it all to be over. My dad is a chair. The title doesn't lie. My dad is a chair. To be specific, he's a fully upholstered bright orange angel accent living room chair. The kind with wooden legs you'd find in any three-piece suit from the 70s. He's pretty comfortable, truth be told. A little lumpy in places, but his padding is soft. Warm, too. He's always warm. There's also the telltale ba-thump, ba-thump, ba-thump coming from his back cushion. 
a steady rhythm at my lumbar to remind me I'm sitting in a no ordinary chair. He wasn't always a chair. Until last year, he was Kevin the accountant. He was 51, slightly overweight, and generally seemed to enjoy life as a human. He was married to my mom. He still is, but well, as you can imagine, it's a little complicated now. It was funny at first. He came home from work one day and just sat in the corner of the living room. When we'd ask him why he was sitting on the floor and not the 4,000 cream leather couch, he just smiled and says, it feels right here. It stopped being funny the morning he didn't go to work. Turns out he hadn't slept the night before. He'd been watching a movie with mom, but hadn't gone with her to bed. She left him sitting in a spot, unsuspicious of the, I'm not tired, I'll be up a little later, lie. She and I both begged him to get up, but he refused to move. Phoned in sick at work, the whole deal. Just spent the day sitting on the floor in his corner. We kept asking him what was wrong why he wouldn't get up except for to use the bathroom and he just kept saying no no this feels right mom phoned the doctor around the third day of this he'd stop eating or drinking you see stopped getting up to use the bathroom too surprisingly though there weren't as many um accidents as you think once he'd allow the last of the food and drink to leave him it seemed to stop coming we also didn't hear his belly growl despite going a day and a half without food. The doctor couldn't make sense of it. Their first guess was that it was psychocosmatic, but that wouldn't explain the absence of digestive activity exposed by the stethoscope. They said they'd be back to take some blood samples in a few days after they liaised with some colleagues. Unfortunately, as I said, this was last year 2020 we never heard back from the doctor thanks to the virus that shall not be named i guess guy with gut troubles who refuses to move is low on the priorities list during a global pandemic somehow mom managed to wrangle long-term sick leave with dad's company decades of loyal employeeism combined with mom's attendance of every company bbq and softball game helped mr bannerfrag by the unexplained stomach concern requiring hospitalization excuse. I'll never forget that phone call. At the time, dad losing his job was the worst case scenario for both of us. He'd always been the breadwinner. Neither of us could support ourselves without him. We'd lose the house in under a year. Dad didn't seem too perturbed by mom's frantic pacing or the lies she wormed through the phone to Mr. Bannerfrag. He just stared at the wall serenely, hovering his butt half a foot from the carpet, balancing with his legs bent and his hands flat on the ground behind him. That night, I fell asleep, listening to Mom yelling at Dad. He never yelled back. We started noticing the physical changes a few days later. That's when we realized this wasn't psychosomatic. Unfortunately, our <coughs> shitty best insurance deal on the market doctor wasn't picking up the phone. We'd get passive-aggressive emails informing us they were waiting to hear back from colleagues, but that was it. This was not good, especially not when the joints in my dad's arms and legs had fused. The not-goodness of the doctor's silence increased a thousandfold when we sent photos of dad's hands and feet flaking off like discarded spider husks the following week. Did the response change? No. We got a very snippy email about shortages in the ICU wards and the critical international situation. Mom shouting match with the chief of medicine, the one she demanded her way up the phone chain to speak to, didn't change things. We were on our own. Mom spent all her time in the living room with Dad. I'd help her wash him, try and make him eat, talk to him when she'd tire out and fall asleep on the rug. Every day of this routine brought with it new changes in Dad's body. It started with his limbs, as you can probably guess. When his hands and feet fell off, there was no blood. They flaked apart, crusty and dry and brittle throughout. Even the bones on his toes and fingers had the density and consistency of dead skin. The wrists and ankles they left behind were smooth and hard. It was difficult to tell whether we were looking at flesh or exposed bone. The dark, shining surface seemed to blend into his normal arm at the base 
of the stumps. This discoloration would rise further up his limbs daily, and before long I woke to see Dad's head and torso fused to the wooden chair leg supporting my weight while I write this. Well, I use the term Dad's head and torso in the loosest possible sense. By the time his limbs were completely replaced, the rest of him had undergone a slow, harrowing transformation of its own. His shoulders and the arms attached to him descended lower and lower. They found their final resting place at Dad's pelvis, sat squarely behind his rigid legs. The chest area they left behind had its own problems. Day by day, Dad's neck retracted further inwards. It didn't stop when his jaw met collarbone either. It pulled Dad's head deep into his ribcage. His face flattened as the skull supporting it sank, forcing his eyes to point in diff opposite directions. Eventually, they slid down to where his nipples once lay, resting glassy and vacant on his pecs. The change wasn't quick enough to break his jaw, though. Instead, it bent outward, its hinges spreading wide across Dad's broad chest. Each morning, I'd find Mom sobbing over a fresh, unnecessary piece of him he'd discarded. Hair, ears, nose, his... um, his... thingy... All of them flaked off and crumbled to dust in her hands. He lost the ability to speak as his head withdrew. Unsurprising though, right? He made his intentions clear before he went. The last words he ever said to me. Don't cry. I am chair. Always was chair. Happy as chair. That was the worst part, I think. Knowing that whatever the fuck was happening to dad, he wasn't resisting it. That when he'd got the initial urge to sit in the corner and not get up, he didn't fight it. That he was happy this way. The implication being that when he was human, when he was a father and a husband and an accountant, he wasn't. Sadly, I still don't know why or how dad became a chair. I didn't post any photos, you see. Mom wouldn't let me. Didn't want the embarrassment. Wanted to keep dad's dignity intact. Thing is, I agreed with her and kind of still do. I'm glad I didn't go to the socials with pics of dad at various stages of his journey. The temptation was there to see if anyone could help. Nobody could have, though. Could they? Dad would have become just another internet circus freak. I've done enough research and digging over the months to know that whatever happened to Dad, he's the only one. Well, almost the only. Mom's own changes started around the time Dad's skin was re-threading into orange fabric, and his eyes had hardened into plastic buttons. Her change was a little different. It started in her torso, stretching her day by day while she remained in a crab pose. I must say, she makes a great couch. Her transformation may have been a little more distressing, but the end results is better. Sorry, Dad. It is what it is. I think the worst part with Mom was the dispotency. Dad was so serene as he changed. Mom, though? Mom wouldn't stop weeping. Quiet sobs, tears that fell for a few days, even after her own eyes had become flat plastic. She wasn't crying because of the change, though, I think. I think it was because she wouldn't get to see how beautiful it'll, I'll look when I go through my own metamorphosis. Thing is, I get it now. Dad was right. He was chair, mom was couch, I am coffee table. I always was. I was scared at first when I realized. The truth hit me like a piano dropping from the Empire State Building. I was scrubbing the last of mom's remaining human skin when it struck through every bone in my wrong body, just as it must have done both dad and mom. I spent that whole night sitting on dad, tears falling down my cheeks, staring at my spot. I didn't want it to be true. I screamed for it to not be more than once. I couldn't deny the facts. I knew deep down in my bones, though, that spot that space on the rug in front of 
chair dad and couch mom is for me. It's mine, where I belong. Unlike blissfully accepting dad and weeping resigning mom, I fought it for a few days. I'm not like them. I'm only 17. I have had dreams, ambitions, goals. I wanted to go to college, settle down, marry some lucky guy and be a mom. I wasn't ready to give up my human form. I spent my nights begging for more time. Nothing answered. The urges didn't abate. My awareness of reality, now the illusions had been swept away, was too great. When I have slept this last week or so, my dreams have always been the same. I dreamt of my true reality, of how I now know things should be. I dream of me in my place, my body elongated and wooden and flat as is right, as is correct, as is natural. I have long, blissful summers, filled with the feeling of hot ceramic mugs on my tabletop and thick carpet beneath my four legs. I can't fight it anymore. I'm posting this here, but also printing out to leave as a note for the removal guys. I want them to be careful with us when the bank repossesses the house and we end up in storage. Please keep us together, if you can. We're a set. Dad's sick leave ended months ago. As you can imagine, the foreclosure notices have been piling up. I stopped caring about the pile of mail under the door around the time that mom's ribcage split and flattened into her wide, pinstripe, velvet upholstered back. I haven't been hungry in days, or thirsty. I'm not even sure if I'm breathing now, I think about it. I'm still scared, but I've come to accept that this is the way things have to be. I don't know why, they just do. Maybe it's a curse, maybe this house is buried on some ancient ritual site, maybe it's just some freak anomaly of physics. Who knows? Whatever the reason, I have to suck it up and accept the way things are. This body, this walking wobbly mass of skin and bone and jiggly bits that I love so much, isn't right. It isn't mine. I'm not meant for it anymore. Once I post this and print the copy for the removal guys, I'm going to get in my spot. Then it's just a case of closing my eyes and waiting. I can already feel my limbs pulling inward my thighs and upper arms sliding to where they'll meet at my navel in a few days. There's a tugging on my back of my knees where they'll bend in on themselves and all 20 of my fingers and toes grow number with each hour that passes. Do I have any regrets? Thousands. There's so much I'll never get to do. To see, to go, to be. I can't hide from the truth though. Not anymore. I am a coffee table. They never stop laughing. When I was a kid, I was on the show called Jerry's Place. The show has basically been erased from public consciousness, so don't rack your brain if you can't remember it. We were working for a small Canadian studio, hoping to market the show to an American audience, but half of season one never even aired. The show followed a fairly typical formula. There was a father and a mother character, wise yet silly parents who dispensed advice and hugs in equal parts. An older teenager sibling who was aloof and angsty but also brought friends over to add color to a small cast. And two younger siblings. One of them very young and the other are around nine or ten who are there to make hijinks and generally move the story along. The latter was my niche. I was the middle child, and I was usually responsible for comic relief or having some part in the problem of the week's story. The two adult characters were Linda and Mike, and they were actually pretty cool too. Mike was a lifelong actor that always had a word of advice or a smile if you were feeling scared. As someone who grew up without a father, Mike was the person I used as a model for what a man should be, though it's probably become interwined with his character on the show to a certain degree. Linda was great too, a mom with kids of her own, 
who was always looking after us when we weren't shooting on set and making sure that we were getting enough to eat. My own mother was working two jobs to keep the light on at home, so there were evenings when I would join Linda and her family for dinner until my mom could pick me up. Linda and Mike were almost like surrogate parents for me during that year of my life, and Rachel and Mark became almost like adopted siblings. Rachel was the older sister, angsty and above it all on camera, but she was always very nice off screen. Rachel would run lines with me when I was scared and always help me when I needed something. She was actually 19, though she played a 16-year-old. And on nights when Linda couldn't take me, I would hang out with Rachel until mom came to pick me up. Mark, the younger brother, was six, and we weren't too far off in age, really. We had similar interests. We would sit around between scenes and talk about Ninja Turtles or Power Rangers or play Game Boy together. In many ways, those five people became family to me for that year and a half of my life. It makes the rest of this story all the harder to tell. It was a typical day of shooting. We had finished what would have been season one and were shooting some scenes for season two. The network had been pleased with our viewership so far, so a second season seemed to be in the cards. With the second season, though, came a live studio audience. This was the 90s, and live studio audiences were all the rage. The first season had been live a few times for special episodes, but this season would have a live audience throughout. The presence of an audience was a bit distracting and often led to Mark and I playing it up a little to get their attention. We had been asked to ignore them, but we were young, and the laughter of adults meant a lot to us. We were on episode 6 of season 2 when they brought in a very different audience. I remember it perfectly. The event gouged into my mind surgically. We were setting up for the opening scene when the stage door opened and a crowd of people filled in. There are about 20 of them. Our audiences tend to be slow and I can remember not seeing any children or strollers as they filled into the dark rows of seats. Usually they brought the house lights up for this, allowing us to see the audience, but today the crowd sat in shadow. Mark whispered to me about it saying they looked a little creepy all huddled up in the dark, but I told him it was probably just something new the director was doing to make us ignore them. We set up for a shot, and I felt myself looking out to the crowd out of the corner of my eye. It wasn't that dark out there, not really, but the whole audience sat in a small sea of darkness that seemed to crowd around them. They didn't talk, they didn't shuffle, they just hunched there and waited for us to begin. We rolled the opening. Jerry's place is filmed before a live studio audience and began. As Mike came on stage, the titular Jerry, I'd expected the crowd to clap as they usually did when a character came on scene. They didn't though, they just sat there and waited. The director looked back at them but shrugged and whispered something to his assistant. Mike looked out at the audience strangely too, but he was a pro and didn't let it mess him up. Linda and Rachel, Megan and Bonnie on the show were watching TV as Mike walked in from the kitchen and delivered his lines. They cued Mark and I to run downstairs and begin the show's problem, a broken toy that was important to me. By the end of the show, Mark would have saved enough money to buy me a new one, and I would learn a lesson about sharing, and everyone at home would feel warm and fuzzy as my brother and I hugged it out. At least that's how it should have gone. I came downstairs yelling about my toy, a model airplane, and Mark was right behind me in typical little brother fashion. Mike looked at the plane and asked if I could just use it like this. I hit my mark and prepared to deliver my character's catchphrase. Catchphrases were prominent in the 90s. They were also very marketable, and my catchphrase was supposed to elicit laughs from the audience. Until then, they had just sit quietly. I wish they had stayed quiet. Play with a broken toy? That's gonna be a deal breaker for me, Pops, I said, looking at the audience as I did so. That's when they started to laugh. I was expecting a chuckle, maybe even a full-fledged laugh or two, but the audience admitted that hearty, canned laughter that you hear on sitcoms when a real audience might be too much. 
Mike started to give his next line, but the audience just kept laughing. I looked at them, my face still holding that mischievous smile that it always did after my catchphrase, and saw that the shadowy crowd was laughing and heaving in unison. The shadowy mob was hitching and chuckling as one being, and I watched. I felt my smile falter. Mike tried to give his next line again, but the laughter overtopped him. The director said something to his assistant, and the man brought out cardboard cards that read, Quiet, please. He held them high right in front of the audience, but the audience just kept laughing. Their laughter had begun to sound sick. The longer they laughed, the more painful and crazed it began to sound. Someone in the crowd was clearly choking, but they continued to laugh through it. The laughter never rose or fell in volume, just the mad, canned laughter I would become so familiar with later in life. It was emotionless and inhuman, and it just continued to pour out of them as they just sat huddled in the shadows. The assistant shouted at the crowd then, the director calling for the cameras to cut. One of the cameramen, I can't remember his name, but he was always kind of a joker, turned to his camera to the film, the crowd. Maybe he thought it would be great for gag reel or something. Perhaps he thought the studio was playing a joke on us, but whatever he was thinking, he had an excellent seat for what happened next. When the assistant shouts failed to gain their attention, he walked into the seats and started yelling at the crowd. That was when his angry shouts turned into underwhelmed laughs and he too started chuckling. The director turned and started shouting at the crowd to be quiet, even as he shouted at his assistant to come down. By this point, we had all started miling about close to our marks so we could start again. I couldn't help but notice Rachel and Linda on the couch and how Linda had a protective arm around Rachel. They looked scared. And despite being trained to stay close to our marks, I went over and sat with them, wanting to be in that protective bubble. A stagehand had gone into the audience to get the assistant back, but now he was sitting and chuckling right along with the rest. It was the same canned laughter, but it sounded like lunatics now. They were consistent, unchanging in pitch or fever, and it was all becoming too spooky for me. Mark came to sit beside me as well, and I wrapped a brotherly arm around him, just as Linda had. I don't like this, Mark cried as big tears rolled down his cheeks. They're scaring me. I told him that I was pretty scared too, and when Mike came up to put his hands on the back of the couch, I felt safe knowing he was there. As we sat, another stage hand went up. He grasped the first by the arm, pulling at him and trying to get him to leave. But soon he too was laughing and grinning as he took a seat next to them. The director forbode anyone else to go up after that. The crew sat huddled together on the edge of the set as they tried to figure out what this was. There seemed to be a barrier between them and us. None of them came into our little circle of protection on the couch, and none of us felt the need to go to them. The director sent a stagehand to get security after the third member of the crew joined them. The stagehand found the doors to be locked, and none of his keys would open them. He came back white-faced, skirting the audience seats as though whatever they had might be airborne. The director sent someone to see if the roof access was open, but they discovered the same thing. Keys didn't work and the hatch was locked. Someone tried a landline in the back but found no dial tone. This was before cell phones had become the norm, but the director had a bag phone and he tried. Same thing, no dial tone, and no calls would go out. And all the while, they laughed. After an hour, they were still laughing. The director and some of the crew had broken the distance and came to sit around our couch. They had brought items from the food service table over, and we all just kind of had a picnic. It would have been nice had the creepy laughing shadow people not been staring at us the whole time. As we ate, I noticed that some of the crew had stayed away and seemed to be eating on the set's outskirts. They kept looking at the crowd. Some of them were staring, and when I asked the director about them, he shook his head. One of them claims that his father is sitting in the audience. What? Mike asked, his mouth full of sandwich. 
He says that man in the front row, near the middle, is his father. He says it can't be him because he died of lung cancer last year, but that it definitely looks like him. He says that every now and again, the laughing man will look at him and try to wave him over. He knows he shouldn't go, but he says that every time the guy waves him over, it's hard not to go. That's nuts, Linda breathes. Each of them has a story like that, the director says. For Carrie, he pointed at the redhead with the ponytail. It's her girlfriend who left for New Mexico and never came back. For Steve, he pointed to a man with salt and pepper crew cut. It's his sister who stopped talking to him after his parents left him. Everything in their will. They all have someone and all of them think they might. But at some point, we saw Carrie get up and take a step towards the chuckling crowd. One of the others grabbed at her, but she shrugged them off and walked towards the crowd like someone in a dream. She embraced one of the shadow masses and then sat next to him, chuckling and smiling as his butt pressed the seat. After Steve left too, the director decided to take action. He told one of the hands near us to turn up the house lights. We wanted lights on the crowd so we could see who they were. Maybe they would stop laughing if their cover was blown and this could all be over, and we could all get back to work. He still seemed to think that this might be a prank, though not a very funny one, and wanted an end to it already. Some of the stagehands went to get things set up, but we all kept looking at that quietly chuckling behemoth. Mark had fallen asleep somehow, and I kept my arm wrapped around him as though I might stand between him and the tide should they charge. I was still munching absentmindedly at fruit from the food table, and I didn't notice Rachel getting up until my bowl of honeydew almost tipped over. Linda grabbed her wrist, anchoring her to the couch, but when I looked up, I could see that her eyes were big and starry. Her blonde ponytail bobbed a little as she scanned the crowd, and Linda started asking her what she was looking for. I thought I saw someone up there, someone I haven't seen in a very long time. But she gasped partially then. It's him! Oh my god, it's him! She was pulling against Linda's hand, but Linda refused to let go. Who, Rach? Who is it? Linda asked, trying to restrain the girl as Mike moved to help. It's my dad! My dad is up there! He, he looks just like he did in the photo my mom has in her dresser drawer. He hasn't changed a bit. I looked at the crowd, trying to see who she was looking at, but failing. Rach, your dad died before you were born. Your mother told me about his accident. It, it can't be him. But it is! Rachel almost screamed, pitching her body from side to side as she tried to break free. Mike and Linda held her tightly, and I scooted closer to Mark so Mike could sit on the couch. The two of them sat there and held her as she sobbed for them to let her go. She used a lot of swear words as she thrashed about, but they refused to let her go. When she finally stopped, she sat crying into Linda's shoulder as the two of them hugged her tightly. Someone yelled down from the catwalk then, and the stage was suddenly awash with light. The overheads were unbearingly bright, and as they all lit at once, I remember tinting my eyes with my hand so they didn't blind me. We had used them for beach scenes a few times when... Rain caused us to not shoot on location, and I can remember thinking that they were so much brighter than the real sun. They lit up every corner of the set, but as I squinted at the seats, I realized I'd have been wrong. Every corner but that one, it seemed. The seats were still a pool of shadows, but when the light hit them, everything changed. The low chuckling became a strange hybrid of screaming and deep, booming laughter. The kind of laughter you heard in an insane asylum. The kind of laughter you heard in hell. The people in the seats never moved, but the darkness did. It plumed out like a fog and started rolling towards us. Those sitting near the seats were hit, and we could hear their laughter starting and... They fell to their knees and clutched their stomachs. The director shouted at the crew to kill the lights, but it was much too late. The darkness was angry now, and 
It was no longer satisfied with the few people it had in the seats. It was coming for us. Mike grabbed Mark and me and lifted us up in his strong arms and started running backstage. He turned to yell for Linda, but she was fighting with Rachel as the girl tried to free herself again. She was straining towards the fog and it was creeping in to get both of them. Mike yelled for her to let Rachel go if she wouldn't come, but Linda refused to leave her there. She strained and pulled at the girl, but Rachel was apparently stronger than she looked. It didn't matter a moment later as the fog rolled in, and they were both little more than chuckling shadows. Mike ran to the back, Mark crying and asking him what was going on. He had woken up when Mike picked him up, and Mike was looking frantically for some way to escape. He saw a window and lifted a piece of wood to smash it against it. As she brought the wood down, however, he might as well have been hitting concrete because the board bounced off, splinters flying. The dark fog was rolling past the set wall now, and Mike was almost out of options. Mark and I just stood against the wall, eyes roving around like scared dogs, trying to make sense of what was happening. Finally, Mike settled on a closet. It was full of brooms and mops, but we didn't have time to move them by that point. Mike pushed us in and sighed as he saw how much room we took up. As the fog plumed behind him, he slammed the door and left us in total darkness. His laughter started a few seconds later, and the sound nearly drove us mad as we huddled in the tiny closet. Mark and I hunched, arms wrapped around each other, expecting that we would both begin to laugh at any minute. We sat like that for a long time. I have no idea how long. We both must have fallen asleep to the sound of Mike's choking laughter. When I woke up, I was in a hospital, and my mother was asleep in the chair next to my bed. I got the whole story a few days later. My mother didn't know much. She had come to the set only to find all the doors locked and the police trying to get in. Once they had gotten in, some of them started laughing and couldn't stop. The paramedics and the fire department had come. After searching the place with breathing equipment, they found Mark and I and brought us to safety. There was nothing wrong with either of us, not physically, but the two of us had been cataconic for nearly three days. The man from the studio, the one in the pristine suit and the oiled hair, had told me a different story. He said there had been some kind of gas leak and claimed that most of those present had been hallucinating due to the gas. The audience, cast, and crew had all died due to gas inhalation, and Mark and I had been lucky to survive. Our parents would both sign non-disclosure agreements. We would promise not to talk about anything we had seen and in exchange for a large amount of financial compensation. My mother and I needed the money now that the show was going to be canceled. Both our parents signed and Mark and I went our separate ways. The whole event was deemed a tragic accident and I never worked in the showbiz again. That would be the end of this story if it weren't for the email I received a week ago. I'm in my 30s now and about a week ago, I got a Facebook request from Mark. I'd expected that he wanted to catch up, have a beer, and share some old stories, but his first message was far from what I had expected. He sent me a messenger request a few seconds later, and after accepting, he sent me seven words. Are they still laughing for you, too? We met up for that beer the next day. Mark was older, but far from doing well. The guy looked rough, borderline homeless, and seemed eternally looking around to see who was near him. He asked if I still heard the laughter. I told him I hadn't, not since that day all those years ago. He said that for him, it had never stopped. He'd wake up to see shadowy figures at the end of his bed, that canned laughter bubbling from their dark lips. He said Rachel and Linda and Mike were right out front, too white teeth smiling as they laughed and laughed. His parents hadn't believed him. They thought it was just bad dreams because of the incident. The drugs, the shrinks gave him just meant he was a drooling zombie as the laughing apparitions chuckled on and on. He started using young. It was alcohol at first. 
His dad had a cabinet in the living room, then drugs when he was in high school. He stole prescription drugs, used blends of different drugs, drank himself into oblivion, but nothing helps. Every night they were waiting for him, and every night he seemed screamed and until they disappeared with the light of the day or the arrival of someone else. Just wanted to see if you found a way to make them stop too, big brother, he said sadly as he left the bar. He killed himself a week later, put a gun in his mouth, and the rest is pretty easy to figure out. I envy him now. I envy that he had the strength to do what needed to be done. About a week ago, I woke up to the sound of that canned laughter that always creeped me out in sitcoms. I fumbled for the remote, thinking I'd left the TV on, but as the TV came to life, I saw them. They were arrayed at the foot of my bed, their bodies made of living darkness, made all the mercury by the light of the TV, and their laughter went on and on. Mark was amongst them, his unkept hair now a raven mane of living darkness. Mike was there too, and Linda, and Rachel, all of them laughing and laughing as I lay in bed, frozen in terror. They left with the sun, and I got up to write this. I don't know how long I can take this. I'm afraid to go to sleep, afraid to see them, but I'm too afraid to take Mark's way out either. I see him amongst them, laughing and laughing like an audience in hell, and I wonder if I'll join them too in the end. I'm afraid to go to sleep, afraid to be awake, afraid to see their faces, and afraid of running into them again. My eyes are getting heavy. The fourth cup of coffee is jerting in my hand. I wonder if it hurts to laugh forever. Perhaps I'll find out soon. Thank you guys for watching. Before you go, I'd like to tell you more about Thank Miss. Thank Miss is on December 11th and our goal is to raise money to help the homeless. I, along with many other creators, will be streaming on Twitch and YouTube to raise money. As of recording this, we have close to 6,000 already raised. Like I said, donating is not an obligation, but if you can, please share the link. All links will be down below, and if you want more information, I'll be linking the video we made for Thank Miss. While you're at it, support the writers of the stories I narrated today. A really huge thank you for all the support. Make sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!